Way out yonder there's a land Where the cooling winds are blowing Far beyond this desert sand Where the crystal streams are flowing Way out yonder where we'll rest from every care Way out yonder somewhere the great divide, way out yonder on the other side, where cool winds are blowing, where clear streams are flowing, way out yonder where my soul shall evermore abide, the saints, the saints will all be gathered up, gathered up someday, and then they will fly, they will fly away, far above this land, far above this day, far above this earth sand, away to the land of day, far away, far away, way out yonder across the great divide, way other side, where cool winds are blowing, where clear streams are flowing, way out yonder where my soul shall evermore abide, the saints, the saints will be all be gathered up, gathered up someday, and then when they my Jesus soul, they will fly, they will fly away. Sand away to the land of day, far away, far away. It is clearly evident that a son holds a more important position in a household than does a servant. Uh, the son, of course, is the heir, and he stands to inherit everything that belongs to the household, including the servants. A servant may be valuable, and he may even be entrusted with many vital responsibilities, but he is still just a servant and not a son. This is one of the next comparisons and contrasts which the writer of Hebrews addresses in this letter. It is a comparison between Moses and Christ. And already the exalted position of Christ has been affirmed. He is greater than the angels. This may have seemed a little confusing to some. How could Christ be greater than the angels when he had come to the earth and lived in a fleshly body? There is always a tendency among men to consider Christ just an outstandingly good man, a superb teacher with an uncanny understanding of human nature, but still nothing more than a man. The writer of Hebrews has pointed out that Christ is the agent through whom the world was made and that he is the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact representation of his nature. Christ is more than just a man. Christ was God in the flesh. In Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, an explanation of Christ's humanity is proclaimed. The Hebrew writer says, But we do see him who has been made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For a time, Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. He took upon him the form of the flesh. The purpose of this was so that he might taste death 
for every man. Later, under a discussion of the priesthood of Christ, we are told that his living in the flesh made him aware of our sufferings. And so he is able to comfort and to show compassion and have understanding on us because he understands our condition. The fact that Christ took upon himself the form of the flesh is not to his detriment, but rather it is to his glory and to our benefit. In Hebrews 2, chapters 14 through 18, the writer further explains, Since then the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, that he might become a merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in the, that which he suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. We should understand that this reference is, that is made here to the seed of Abraham is not referring exclusively to Jews. The comparison being drawn uh, has to do with uh, angels and men. Christ did not come to minister to angels. He came to minister to men, and therefore he took on him the form of the flesh. The seed of Abraham here refers to the human condition which all men share, both Jew and Gentile alike. And perhaps in this specific uh, context here in Hebrews, it may be more specifically applied to Christ when he came in the flesh. But spiritually speaking, the seed of Abraham are all of those who come into covenant relationship with Christ. And Paul makes this clear in a passage written to the church at Galatia, where he wrote, For you are all the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. The true seed of Abraham are all of those who have been baptized into Jesus Christ. It is not a matter of a physical birth into a certain nation among men, but rather it is a matter of the new birth by water and the Spirit into the family of God. Christ living in the flesh was a necessary part of the work that he came to accomplish. This was the only way that he could deal with sin and its effect upon men. He too had to suffer in the flesh. He had to be tempted in all points just as we are. Yet even so, Jesus was found without sin. Therefore, his death upon the cross was not justified from the standpoint of sin, the flesh. The law stated, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Christ did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, and yet he died on the cross. It was not for his sins that he died, but for the sins of the whole world. And all we can say is, hallelujah, what a savior. Could such a one as this be greater than Moses? And so this is the next point to which the writer in Hebrews affirms. In drawing this comparison between Moses and Christ, the writer does not criticize Moses and detract from his ministry. On the contrary, he says that one of the ways in which Moses was equal to Christ was in his faithfulness to God. Moses was faithful in his house, we're told. The house referred to here is the children of God. Very often the scriptures call God's people either his household or his family. 
And so Moses was faithful to all that God had given him to do in the house of Israel. There was not anyone, unless it might have been Abraham, whom the Jews held in higher esteem than Moses. Moses was a great leader and an important figure in the Bible, and yet Moses was still just a man. The Jewish rabbis, though, had almost deified Moses. The rabbis said that the soul of Moses was equivalent to the souls of all Israel. And they arrived at this conclusion by a process called gematria. The Kabbalistic Jews assigned numerical values to letters. And by this process, they arrived at a numerical value for names and phrases. In Hebrew, the letters of Moses, our rabbi, was equal to the number 613. This was also the value of the letters of Lord God of Israel. The rabbis said that the face of Moses shone like the sun and that he alone saw through a clear glass, not as the other prophets did through a dim glass. They further said, that there were 50 gates of understanding in the world and all, all of them but one was opened to Moses. So such was the high regard which Moses held among the Jewish people. The writer in Hebrews compares Moses to a servant in the house while he says that Christ was a son. We read in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses was also in all his house. For he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone but the builder of all things is God. Now, Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. According to the book of Hebrews, Christ is like the builder of the house, while Moses compares to the building itself or some of its furnishings. Of course, the architect of a house is greater than the house itself, and so Christ is greater than Moses. And this is not to say that Moses was unimportant, nor that he was unfaithful. Moses was a faithful servant but Christ was faithful as a son. And so once again, we perceive the shadow and substance. The shadow is Moses, but the substance is Christ. The shadow is the law of Moses, but the substance is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The shadow is fleshly Israel, but the substance is the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Moses himself had pointed to the substance when he stated in the book of Deuteronomy, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. This is according to all that you ask of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from their countrymen like you. I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Deuteronomy 18 verses 15 through 19. The prophet like unto Moses was Jesus Christ. He was the one who came speaking the words which the Father had given him. And these are the words which he said would judge us in the last day. 
Moses and the law were only a preparatory step leading up to Christ. In another passage of Scripture, the great difference between the shadow and the substance was pointed out by Christ himself. The people had followed Jesus after the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, hoping to see more miracles like this. They referred Jesus to the way that Moses had provided manna in the wilderness for the children of Israel. And Jesus directs their attention to the reality which the manna had only foreshadowed. In John chapter 6, verses 32 through 35, Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. They said therefore to him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. It was not Moses who provided the man in the wilderness, but rather it was God, the Father. God was the builder of the house of Israel, just as he is the builder of the house in which the faithful now dwell. The real substance to which the manna in the wilderness pointed was Jesus Christ. The manna in the wilderness was genuine, and it sustained the physical lives of the children of Israel during their wanderings. But now something even better than that physical bread had come. Jesus said that he was the true bread which was sent down from heaven. The one who partakes of the spiritual bread in Christ will never hunger. So many people today are still looking around on the ground for manna and are missing the true bread which has come down from above. Those to whom the writer of Hebrews addressed himself were in danger of going back to the old shadows and types and thereby missing the substance which was in Christ. And there are still those today who labor under a delusion in regard to Moses and the old law. They are trying to serve the servant rather than yielding themselves wholeheartedly to the son. The shadow of the law had its place and served its purpose in God's scheme of redemption. But the shadow has been replaced by the true substance revealed in Jesus Christ. And so the Son of God invites us into his house where we can become joint heirs with him. So we see the shadow and the substance. The shadow was Moses, the substance is Christ. The shadow was the old law. The substance is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The shadow was fleshly Israel, but the substance is the house of God today, spiritual Israel. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we do thank you for the Old Testament and all those things that were written before for our learning. We're thankful for men like Moses and Abraham who were faithful in their time to follow you and to do what you had for them to do. We are thankful, Father, for the law that was our tutor to bring us to Christ as we learn in the New Testament. And we thank you, Father, for all of those types from the Old Testament that point forward to Christ our Lord, the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world for the sins of all men. And we thank you, Father, that now in these last days you've spoken to us through your Son. And may we listen to him, may we hear him. And just as Moses said, you would raise up a prophet like unto him, and that we should listen to him and he would be given your words to deliver to us. And so we're thankful for the gospel of Jesus Christ and for the hope that is ours through Christ our Lord. Father, help us to be faithful to your gospel and help us to be so grateful for your great love and mercy that have been showered upon us in Christ. And we know, Father, according to your word, that our sins have been taken away. They've been nailed to the cross 
And we praise you for this, Father. And help us to serve you joyfully in the strength of this great truth that in Christ our sins are forgiven, that we stand justified in your sight by the blood of Jesus. May this spur us on, Father, to love you more and more. And may our love for you cause us to want to serve you all the days of our life. We thank you again, Father, for Jesus and for the hope that is ours in Christ. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, we pray that all is well with you and your family, wherever you are in this world. And we pray that wherever you are, that you are faithful to the Lord, that the Lord will lead and guide you daily in doing his will and serving him as faithfully as you can, wherever you are. Until we see you again, we pray the Lord will bless and keep you. Now don't you know on the judgment day that gold and silver will melt away? I'd rather be in a deep dark grave and know that my poor soul was saved than to live in this world in a house of gold and deny my God and do my soul and deny my God and do my soul some people still, they cheat and lie, for wealth and wealth it will buy, but don't they know on the judgment day that gold and silver My poor soul was saved Than to live in this world In a house of gold And deny my God And do my soul And deny my God